Welcome to this week's theology study, and today we're going to be talking about the guidance of the Holy Spirit, how this Holy Spirit guides and directs God's people. And the Bible is full of examples showing us that the Holy Spirit guides and directs God's people, and we'll look at a few of those and just in, discuss the general idea. But I want to start with the, just a warning that's actually even in the book of Isaiah, if we read Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, and I'm reading it from the literal translation version for a reason. It says, Woe to rebellious sons, declares Jehovah, to make counsel, but not from me, and to weave a covering web, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin on sin. And what we see in that uh, passage, and I chose the literal because I wanted us to see that he's talking about, you're seeking counsel, but not of my spirit. And it, it's referencing the spirit of the Lord. This passage suggests it is sin to make counsel and plans without being open to the guidance from God's Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not only is it something that happens or that can happen or that is a good idea, it's actually expected of God, that God expects us to listen to his Spirit. When I think of that, even in uh, when we could use an example of the Gibeonites, in, uh, in or the early uh, days when the exodus occurs and the children of Israel were told explicitly by the Lord not to make any allegiances with any of the people of the land. And the Gibeonites were in fear of their being destroyed as Israel's conquering the various city kingdoms throughout uh, the land of Canaan. And they come to the Israelites, and, and many of you, I'm sure, know the story. They, they come, and they're wearing old rotten clothes, and they put moldy bread in their sacks, and they pretended to really be from a far-off land and, and all of this sort of thing. And it was a big con job. And they wanted to make an allegiance with Israel. And instead of consulting the Spirit of the Lord, they'd already been told, Joshua and the people of Israel had already been told not to make agreement with the people of that land and not to help them. And so they already knew better. And instead of seeking the Lord's advice on this, they made a, an agreement with them. And it became, a, it became a, something the Lord really didn't appreciate. And these people were left in the land. And it wasn't God's original plan. And so w when we think of that, you know, that had they um, been sensitive to the guidance of the Spirit of God, had they o followed what later becomes advice in the book of Isaiah, they wouldn't have made that agreement with the Gibeonites. And, and, so And it looked like they were doing a good thing to them. They thought they were being compassionate and kind. They, they had all these theories that seemed right in the sight of man. But it wasn't right according to the Spirit of the Lord. And, and so then we later see in Isaiah where he says, Woe to you rebellious sons, because you're, you're making plans and you're making decisions without consulting the Lord's guidance. And... and when we fail to listen to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, then we are being rebellious children of the Lord. And that's an interesting thing to think about in this day and age when so many people who don't believe in Jesus and don't know the Lord are telling the church how to act. And there's there's so much out there nowadays where they're, they're you know, telling us how to feel, how to think, what kind of ministries we should be doing, all of these things. Uh, and the truth is, we're supposed to be seeking God's influence in our daily lives. And that's much of what we want to talk about. And so even as you read this passage in Isaiah chapter 30, you discover that it is describing a people who are leaning on their own understanding and their own solutions instead of the Lord. And the people had been deciding on the basis of their own wisdom and common sense without sensitivity to God's Spirit. So we need to trust the Holy Spirit's guidance as there is no way to predict the ultimate outcome of a matter or a decision. And, and I think that's good advice. And 
And I will say personally, that's something I do a, a great deal in my in my personal life and ministry is um, when when people are talking and things are coming up, I'm always checking and trying to sense what the Holy Spirit's saying, yay or nay or any of these kinds of things, instead of just reasoning it out. As logical as I like to be, I know that I have to listen to the voice of the Lord. And and so we we can also if we go further and we look in the New Testament, and I will say throughout the Old Testament you'll see the guidance of the Holy Spirit dealing with various prophets and things like that. But when we go into the New Testament, the first example, one of the early examples we see, is is when the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted. Now that's an interesting experience, and you can read about that in three places. The, the first two, Matthew 4.1 and Luke 4.1, and that's pretty easy to remember, both talk about Jesus being led in the Spirit, in the wilderness by the Spirit. But Mark, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 12, states it very abruptly, and, 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 it's, and, and it's so strong in terms of the leading of the Spirit. He says this, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And we see this thing that not only is the Holy Spirit leading, but it's the Holy Spirit driving him into the wilderness. And, you know, I've had those experiences where sometimes I have this gentle leading of the, the Spirit or a whisper, but other times I feel driven by the Spirit to do something. And, and it's different. And, and so we see that. But imagine... That possibility for a minute, if you will, that the Holy Spirit could guide a truly righteous person to a place to face temptation. We know this. Jesus was perfect in all his ways. He was truly righteous. And the Holy Spirit led him in the wilderness so that he could face the temptation. And if you'll read in there and you'll notice it, if you look in Luke 4, you'll see that particularly that Jesus wasn't tempted after being in the wilderness 40 days. According to scripture, he was tempted for the entire 40 days. So a lot of people miss that point. So you might want to check that. It should be in Luke 4. It should be about verse 4 that it says that. Uh, but, but imagine that. That the Holy Spirit would lead someone into a place where they would have to have a moral struggle into a place where they would have to grapple with their commitment to God. And, and that's an interesting concept, that even Jesus was led by the Spirit for this experience that he had, which we know he emerged victoriously, and that's good news. That doesn't mean you can blame God for yielding to temptation, because it's you that yields to it. But it's an interesting thing, and maybe that doesn't fit with your theology. I understand that. But I will say this. It's a shame when what the scriptures actually say doesn't fit with someone's theology. And my belief is that if what the scriptures actually say doesn't fit with your theology, then your theology is broken. So there are some other examples of a very direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. I'll change the subject a little bit. And, and we see that. I'm going to read a few of those out of the book of Acts of examples of what I would call a very direct guidance by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, 29, it says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go to the carriage and stay, and stay close to it. And that's when he meets the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Spirit saying, Run up there and get close to it. And um, when he does, he gets to witness to the, to the man from Ethiopia. But we see it that it's direct. The Holy Spirit says, Go do this thing. And then... Um, in another uh, example, when Peter's on the roof and he's having a vision and it's all kinds of unclean animals in a sheet, and he hears the Lord say, "Arise, kill and eat," and but the, in that and just before he goes to Cornelius's house, and then the Spirit of the Lord tells him something very significant. It's Acts chapter ten, verses nineteen and twenty, where he says, uh, "Peter was still thinking about the vision when the Spirit said to him, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs." Don't hesitate to go with these men. I have sent them. So again, the, the Holy Spirit is, is directly telling Peter what to do. And and uh, so we have examples um, of, of in, in Acts chapter 13. 
if we look at verse 2, uh, when, they're, when they're talking about they're praying and they're fasting, and they're looking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And, and we see it, th it says this, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set Barnabas and Saul apart for me. I want them to do the work for which I have called them. So again, very direct. Set Paul and Barnabas apart. It, it's not just this sense or an intuition or what I would call an unction, but it's a very clear direction from the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8.39 when they had stepped out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The official joyfully continued on his way and didn't see Philip. And, and that's an interesting one. Uh, well, let me read verse 40. Philip found himself in the city of Azotus. He traveled through all the cities and spread the good news until he came to the city of Caesarea. Now, that's a pretty clear direction from the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in the Ethiopian and as they come out of the water, the Holy Spirit grabs Philip and miraculously translates him to a completely different city. I would say if that happens, you know what God wants. And, and so that's pretty interesting, makes it clear. And there are examples of, of those kinds of things happening in the Old Testament as well in terms of, of that kind of intervention. And we, you can read about those. I'm just going to list the scriptures. 1 Kings 18.12, 2 Kings 2.16, Ezra 11.1 are three examples. There are more. And mostly in our lives today, and, and often what we even see in the book of Acts, there's this sense that the guidance of the Holy Spirit isn't as dramatic as some of those direct examples. Now, those still exist, and they do happen to people, but they're not as prominent. But scripture speaks more about being led by the Spirit. And, and I think that's important. And, and it's not, it doesn't have to be this spooky, mystical thing. It's you, you are walking with the Lord. You have Jesus in you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're reading his word. You're in worship. You're seeking him. You're walking with him. You're the obedient and, and there's something that's happening where the Holy Spirit is, is whispering in your heart on a regular basis, leading you. And, and that's, that's significant. And Christians should be open to that sense or unction from the Lord. Um, it's more of a daily guidance or influence that we're talking about. And in Romans 8, 14, it says, Certainly all who are guided by God's Spirit are God's children. And we, we see this, that there's this ongoing guidance occurring in God's children that, that's significant. Galatians 5.18, if your spiritual nature is your guide, you are not subject to Moses' laws. Now the point of that is not that the Moses' laws are tossed aside, not that morality is thrown out, but that person that's daily walking in the guidance of the Holy Spirit isn't going to be violating the commands of the Lord. And, and that's what we really get. That he's talking to a, a people who thought they could be saved through adherence to the law. And what he's saying is what you really need is spiritual transformation. Because when, as you're transformed, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you down a moral path. And, and you won't have to wonder what's in the law or what isn't in the law. In fact, as a younger Christian, there are a lot of times the Holy Spirit would convict me of something that I had never, I didn't, wasn't aware that the, there was a scripture telling me it was wrong, but the Holy Spirit convicted me just the same, and, and I would avoid something, and then find out later in my Bible read, oh look, that's why he did that, because the Bible says you shouldn't. And, and so that's how that works. Now this is what is considered, according to scripture, as walking according to the Spirit, and, and rather than according to the flesh. And Romans 8, 4 says, So that the righteous demand of the law might be fulfilled in us, those not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we see this dynamic uh, difference between walking according to the flesh and according to the Spirit. When you think of what it is to walk according to the flesh, it's not just the desires of the flesh, but also the desires of your human mind, which is part of your flesh, essentially. And it's your brain. And, and we, we have desires, and we look at things, and, and we might walk according to those things that are earthly. And yet, as we get saved, and the Lord is working in us, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
the Spirit begins to work in us to walk according to those things that are spiritual and godly. And Galatians 5.16, uh, Paul writes, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the word there for lust is deep desire. And, and what's interesting, it should be noted that this is different than just obeying scriptural command. And when we think about that and, and that deep desire that, that we would desire to do what God finds pleasing, that it'd be something, something quickening us to hunger after what God finds pleasing or the Holy Spirit desires instead of just what our flesh desires. And, and so we want to note, as I said just a minute ago, that this is different than just obeying spiritual commands. For in this chapter in Galatians 5, when we read about Paul is contrasting the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. And the implication is that our lives should be responding moment by moment to the spirit. It's important to obey the scriptural commands. It is. It's important to read it in scripture and want to obey it and follow it. But it's not just a mental or physical activity. It's something the spirit is quickening in us. That's why there'll be sermons that'll grab our heart because the Spirit's leading you to respond to it. Or we'll read a scripture and it'll jump off the page at us because the Holy Spirit is leading us to respond to it. Or sometimes we'll be in a conversation, we'll sense a caution from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's the Holy Spirit's gentle unction as he works in, in our spirit. And, and that's the implication, moment by moment. We should be responding to the Spirit. Thus, as faithful Christians, walking in the obedience to the Word, the Holy Spirit puts righteous desires in us. And, and thus, we can be led. And I love that. You know, that's we become this new creature. Even in Romans 7, when Paul talks about the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, I don't want to do. And what he's identifying is what my desires have changed i have a bad habit and he says that i realize it's no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me he says i have a sinful habit that's getting the best of me but my desires are changed because washing according to the spirit you're sensing the spirit's desires rather than your own and, and so when we respond to the spiritual desires we can be led of the holy spirit and we can continue on to see that throughout the book of Acts, uh, people can be seen being led by the Spirit in various different ways. Uh, there are even instances where people are established in ministry offices uh, by the leading of the Spirit. And to, the, to this day, that's much how things work uh, in our own movement within Foursquare when we're looking for pastors and, and we're talking that over, who should pastor this church and that church. and and uh, I've held an office where I was involved in that quite a bit in the past. And we're, we're praying and we're sensing and we're seeking, well, what is the Holy Spirit saying? And, and maybe someone looks really good on paper, but we'll say, you know, there's just something there that we're not sure of. And it's about sensing the Holy Spirit. And, and spirit, good, solid, mature spiritual leadership will often do that. And it's very wise because the Spirit knows what's best. Um, it's important in, in, to note this in the process. It's important not to credit the leading of the Spirit with your own whims. And that's the difference when we talk about following the leading of the Spirit. Some people use that as a, as a catch-all that's unhealthy. Some people will, will say they're being led by the Spirit when truthfully they're just, they're just puffed up in their own fleshly mind and they're following their whims but trying to say it was the Spirit. And, uh, you know... You're, you need to guard yourself against those people. And I'm not really talking about, well, how, how am I going to reason with people who are in their own fleshly mind being puffed up and, and trying to say something to the Spirit when it's not. The truth is I'm not trying to reach those people. They're, they're in a bad place with the Lord if they're doing that, and their own arrogance won't allow them to be taught. I'm talking to us about let's make sure that's not what we're doing truly know what the Spirit's leading and don't credit Him with things that you want selfishly. Uh, that's a good caution. People who are, who are upside down in their own religious practice who will not listen to the Holy Spirit and are trying to say they have the Spirit but 
but fleshly in their fleshly selfish way are doing their own thing aren't going to listen to me or the spirit so they're in a bad place and they're setting themselves up because it borders on some sort of blasphemy i mean think about it you're actually blaspheming the holy spirit to some point giving him credit for something you want that isn't from him that's as we read in isaiah you know he calls them rebellious children who do that um, so I think there should always be a caution there. Now as we wrap this up, um, all of this shows us that the Holy Spirit does guide and direct God's people. Of course there have been abuses in history. And, and we know that. What we see in Scripture and in, real, in the real world is that the Holy Spirit definitely guides and directs God's people. We also know historically and in Scripture that there are, have been abuses of the spirit and, and people saying it was the spirit and we have that example of the prophet that goes into Israel and prophesies a certain destruction and the Lord had told him go in and come out a different way and don't stay with anyone and don't stop and, an, and another guy comes along and says well I have a the spirit of the Lord has shown me that you're supposed to come to my house for dinner he was lying and it got the prophet killed and when the prophet died, the man said he should have obeyed the Lord. <laughs> you know, a lot of help. You don't need friends like that. But notice the righteous prophet was judged for not listening to the Spirit when that false prophet lied to him. And we want to remember that as people of the Lord. There will always be people like that. And, and uh, we, need, we need to have a good sense of the Holy Spirit. But um, suffice to say that the Holy Spirit never leads people to be unholy. What I would say is God's not fickle. And in the example of the prophet that goes and should come out a different way, God's not fickle. God told him what he wanted him to do. And the whole time God knew this other guy would come along. And he ended up, because he disobeyed, got eaten by a lion. And, and so on and so forth. But uh, God's not fickle. If God tells you to do something, he wants you to do it. It's people that are fickle. And, and the other thing is the Holy Spirit will never lead you to sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead people to be unholy. And, and I would further indicate that I personally, as a pastor with a certain amount of experience, am unlikely to trust the spiritual leaders of unholy people. And I think that's important. I don't think the unholy should speak to the holy. And when, when, some, when someone whose life isn't that of a Christ-like person wants to tell me what the Lord is saying, I'm not interested because they're not listening to him or they'd live a different kind of life. And remember, it was Jesus who told us in Matthew chapter 7 that it's by their fruit you will know them when speaking of false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. Amen? And, and so we want to remember that, that when, when someone's wanting to say, oh, I'm following the lead in the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing about their life that shows that they're led by anything holy. Uh, it's by their fruit that they are known. And we, never, we can never quite escape that. And, and Jesus, of course, is talking about the fruit of what? The fruit of the Holy Spirit which is the fruit of those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, which you can read about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So, so next week we will be talking about the Spirit providing a God-like atmosphere. Till then, the Lord bless you, and we'll see you then.